All right, good afternoon and welcome to the Science in the Age of COVID-19 seminar series out of Howard Hughes Medical Institute, Penelia Research Campus. Um, each week at uh, Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, we try to dig into the science of SARS-2 and ways that we might be able to fight back against this pandemic. The Zoom link remains the same for every week. This week, we're happy to welcome Dr. Ben Tenover from Mount Sinai, better known as the Virus Ninja. Ben has a long and proud history studying viruses, the function of their proteins and nucleic acids, and in particular, host response pathways that it uses to fight off the virus. Uh, ben is going to fill us in on a lot of recent, mostly unpublished data, showing how the body reacts to SARS-2 and ways that we might make use of these data sets to try to fight back. Okay, Ben. Thanks, Lauren. I think that's the first time I've been uh, told that I was most known as Virus Ninja. That's rather embarrassing. Um, that, that, uh, that handle came about because years ago when Twitter was just coming into its uh, genesis, I did this uh, round robin tournament with uh, a variety of genetic viral mutants and we played a, like a NCAA tournament and I had people follow it and so Virus Ninja made a lot of sense for the handle then and it makes a, a little less sense now. But in any case, um, thank you for the invitation to be here. Uh, it's, it's great to be uh, part of the, the Janelli enterprise again. Uh, I, as I was saying earlier, I'm really sad not to be there in person but um, yeah, I, I, one thing that I definitely like about Zoom is that, um, you know, we can invite anybody from uh, all, uh, all walks of life and anywhere in the world. Uh, I think my dad is watching right now, so I, I thank you for that opportunity as well. Um, so today we're going to go into the weeds a little bit uh, with regards to how this virus interacts with host. Uh, it is um, work that's been going on in my lab now for the past two and a half months in collaboration with other just amazing scientists and amazing labs and, and where relevant I try to incorporate uh, other findings from other publications to try and give everybody um, you know a, a cohesive story. Um, so these numbers were as of I think yesterday um, I think as everybody on the planet now knows uh, SARS-CoV-2 is the virus that's responsible for the COVID-19 epidemic uh, with almost uh, on our way to four million confirmed cases and uh, more than a quarter million deaths. Uh, I'm at Mount Sinai, uh, which is located in Manhattan in New York City, uh, and I'm a professor of microbiology. Uh, so today, um, like I said, we're really going to get into the weeds a little bit uh, with regards to what we know and don't know about this virus. Um, and so I'm going to really walk through what, what we've been really busy doing here. Um, my lab has for, for now almost 13 years been studying virus host interactions. Um, uh, not just uh, the, the immune response in, in vertebrates, but we also love the evolution of the antiviral response and, and how it has been shaped over time and by different viruses. Uh, but today we're really going to focus on, um, of course, how we respond to SARS-CoV-2. And um, instead, we're going to look at three different model systems. Uh, so the first one will be homogeneous cultures. So these are just, you know, your standard run-of-the-mill cell lines, um, a little bit more sophisticated uh, primary cells. But again, uh, homogeneous uh, cells uh, in, in a plate. Um, and so we'll characterize those and we'll use those really the way all labs around the world use those and that is to you know do some loss of function work and, and really get into uh, how the cell recognizes that it's infected by SARS-CoV-2, how that recognition results in a response to that virus and then how that virus manipulates that response. Um, once we have a good sense of what that's supposed to look like uh, in, in these kind of, um, you know, very uh, non-physiological systems, we will go a little bit more physiological and start looking at heterogeneous cultures. Uh, this is in work with Cornell and involves a lot of organoids. I'll explain that when I get there. And then we'll end with animal models, which will include both, both ferrets and uh, COVID-19 patients directly. Uh, so this is the virus we're going to talk about. I thought Nevin uh, last week gave a really great introduction about each of these proteins. Hey ben, uh, ben, yep. can you share your slides, please? Oh, you can't see my slides? That's oh. right. Sorry. I'm going through this for no reason. Hang on. Sorry. You've made perfect sense so far. but I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad. All right. So um, here, just let me, uh, so this is what, uh, can you see it now? 
No, not yet. What? All right. Well, uh, my apologies. Perfect. Now we can see your screen. All right. Can you see the full screen? Yep. You're good to go. All right. So this was my, my introduction slide. Uh, this is what I just said as to the organization of the talk. And uh, here's where I was about to launch into. So uh, as I was saying, I thought Nevin Krogan did a really great job last week uh, introducing all the open reading frames of this virus as they uh, have just recently published in uh, Nature in a collaboration with both investigators here and at Pasteur uh, and, and elsewhere, you know, the interactum of all these different transcripts. Um, uh, for, for those of you who, who might be new to the biology of the virus, basically the virus makes this ORF1A and then by frame shift this ORF1B. Uh, and this really represents the uh, replication machinery of the virus. Uh, and later in infection, what ends up happening is the virus begins to make essentially the antigenome start, starting on the three prime end of the genome, but will periodically jump at a TRS site back to this side and make all these subgenomic RNAs, which then serve as new mRNA substrates for spike, which is, of course, the receptor, and then all these accessory proteins. And some of these will come up uh, later on in the uh, antagonism part of the talk. So this is our beast. And this is the general life cycle of the virus. So uh, again, uh, I'm sorry for all of those who, who know and eat and breathe this kind of thing. But for those of you who don't, uh, SARS um, spike protein here in green binds to the ACE2 re uh, receptor. And the attachment protein spike allows for the endocytosis of this virus. And when it comes in, essentially it's contagious mRNA. So it can immediately be loaded onto the host ribosome and produce the necessary replication machinery to amplify more genome. Uh, it's only later as re replication uh, has ensued for some time that it starts pr producing this negative sensor antigenome, which is gonna give rise to all these other subgenomic transcripts. And these include nucleocapsid, spike, membrane envelope, and a number of accessory proteins. Uh, and then, of course, they go through all the necessary uh, translation, or transcription and translation in the cytoplasm. Everything happens in the cytoplasm. Uh, the secreted proteins go through the ER uh, transport system until eventually you start uh, assembling a virus here um, uh, at the, uh, in, in the endoplasmic reticulum and then bud out new virus. Uh, with regards to this life cycle, um, you know, this is obviously what the virus would like to do if left uh, uninhibited. Uh, and of course, we have evolved some very sophisticated responses to deal with virus infection. And this is really what I've been studying for my PhD, my postdoc, and now as I run the lab. And uh, a lot of this comes down to uh, the production of, of viral products that the cell can recognize as non-self. So very much like the adaptive immune response, which distinguishes between proteins that we encode versus proteins that are foreign, at, a, at an intracellular level, um, cells have the capacity to recognize largely nucleic acids that have very odd structures. So this would include RNA that is double-stranded, um, RNA whose five prime end um, has a diphosphate or a triphosphate, um, or RNA with just a lot of secondary structure or really heavy in CG content all these things that don't necessarily ever exist with host mRNA. And this allows them to um, be recognized and evolve as what we refer to now as pathogen associated molecular patterns or PAMPs. Um, the machinery that recognizes PAMPs, they're universally referred to as pattern recognition receptors. And the two dominant ones inside of the cell here are the RIG-I and MDA5 uh, pattern recognition receptors. Uh, Toll-like receptors also play a role in this, but that's more uh, with regards to specialized immune cells than it is in your typical endothelial cell, epithelial cell, or pneumocyte where this virus likes to, likes to replicate. So presumably what happens is the virus comes in, it begins to initially uh, translate its replicates and then undergo some amplification of its genome. And somewhere along these lines, it's going to start producing aberrant RNA just because uh, all viruses at some point start producing aberrant RNA. And here's really where the first of the, the battle between virus and host ensues as aberrant products from the virus form, um, these pattern recognition receptors, so RIG-I for example, uh, tends to like double, short double-stranded RNA that has a triphosphate or a diphosphate exposed end, whereas MDA5 is thought to, to prefer binding to a long double-stranded RNA. And so if those 
PAMPs are formed, these pattern recognition receptors will bind and start multimerizing onto that substrate and eventually signal to this uh, mitochondrial antiviral protein, which is uh, called as such because it's associated with the mitochondrial membrane. And it starts to assemble this essentially this giant activation complex, which includes uh, a number of kinases, including uh, all these IKK related kinases. So there is IKK alpha, beta, epsilon, and TBK1. And these kinases are responsible for the activation of transcription factors that are, um, are that include NF-kappa B, which is a, a very broad acting transcription factor, which responds to a lot of different stresses. Uh, and the IRS, most notably with virus uh, interferon regulatory factor three. Um, so IRF three's main um, uh, kinase or activator is, is TBK1. And so as an example, just if, if the cell had its way with this virus, the virus, let's say in this example, produces double-stranded RNA, Rig I or MDA5 would bind to this product, multimerize, signal to MAVs, which brings in all this necessary machinery to kind of aggregate and induce the phosphorylation of these two transcription factors and activates them in different ways. Essentially what happens then is they go into the nucleus, they form a, a, a number of different complexes that are responsible for the induction of a transcriptional response aimed at slowing down or inhibiting virus infection. And so one of the most important complexes that form in this first infected cell is called the enhancesome. Uh, and this is the complex as depicted. It is four IRFs, either uh, IRF3 dimers or IRF3 in, con in conjunction with another IRF called IRF7, uh, in addition to NF-kappa B, which are two subunits called uh, P50 and P65. So these guys all assemble, they bring in histone acetyltransferase equipment, and ultimately what they do is they induce the early induction of type 1 or maybe type 3 interferons, depending on the site of infection. And so these interferons have a secondary wave of, of induction, which I'll talk to you about in one minute. But I also think it's important because there's clearly some confusion in the literature right now about this, that the activation of IRF3 and NF-kappa B can also induce genes that we canonically refer to as interferon-stimulated genes. That means genes that can be activated both by this pathway I'm about to talk about, but also directly in response to virus infection. That's a really important um, thing that we're gonna get back to uh, later in this talk. In any case, with regards to interferon, the kind of the job of this first infected cell is to warn its neighbors of this eminent infection. So, sorry, this imminent infection. And so what ends up happening is interferon gets secreted out of this cell and now can bind to either to itself in an autocrine manner or to neighboring cells in a paracrine manner. And they bind receptors and they bring together these two subunits. Uh, and these subunits are associated with uh, different tyrosine kinases of the Janus kinase family. They're not depicted here, just for simplicity. And what you end up with is the phosphorylation of one of these two members. So there is the STAT1 family of transcription factors here, and then STAT2, which is constitutively bound to a member of the same family as this IRF3 here called IRF9. And so tyrosine phosphorylation of STAT1 and STAT2 allows these two complexes to bind together. Um, STAT2 is a funny protein because um, unlike all the other STATs that exist, its uh, evolutionary homology is actually quite uh, poor. Uh, and in fact, its DNA binding domain has essentially um, is no longer functional. And so as a result, it needs this IRF9 because this IRF9 dictates its capacity to bind DNA. So STAT2 in this complex serves as the bridge between STAT1 and IRF9 to make this complex called ISDF3, which then engages again DNA very much like the system over here, except the, the DNA binding elements over here uh, are very similar because they involve an IRF, but are a little bit different because now it's half of an IRF site and half of a STAT site. And so this induces another large swath of genes, probably an order between 250 and 500 genes. And these are what we refer to commonly as interferon stimulated genes. And so again, the genes we refer to as interferon stimulated genes, their job is to really try and inhibit virus infection by stopping transcription, stopping translation, stopping viral aggress, um, they prone cells to apoptosis, uh, and they induce a, a secondary message of, of chemokines, which are going to um, take on a, a, a role I'll discuss in a minute. Um, but I just do want to stress that the activation of this pathway on the left and this pathway on the right have a lot of overlap, somewhere in the order of 80% overlap in the genes induced over here versus the genes induced over here. And so for all the people doing single cell sequencing who often see ISGs and refer to it as interferon signaling, 
I think you really need to be careful with that statement because of the extent of overlap between these two pathways. All right, so what is this all good for? Well, just to kind of sum it up in a, in a really simplistic form, you know, following the production of PAMP observed here and the recognition of that PAMP by pattern recognition receptors, it's really these three families of transcriptional complexes that are responsible for the cellular response to virus. So that is IRF3s, which can act alone as IRF3 dimers or IRF3, IRF7 heterodimers. IRF1 is also playing a role in this pathway. There's NF-kappa B, which has both canonical and non-canonical versions, but for simplicity, let's just call them P50 and P65 here. And then there's the ISGF3, which is a combination of STAT and IRF fused together. And collectively, these guys will, in these transcription factor complexes will induce either what I refer to as the call to arms. This is the interferon response, as well as all those genes that they can induce directly. So this includes things like MX, which is thought to be uh, a blocker of everything from RNA-dependent RNA polymerases to uh, nucleocapsid transport in the cell. Uh, OAS tags double-stranded RNA. PKR um, is a translational blocker. IRF7 is a new transcriptional factor mix, which is much more promiscuous than IRF3. So it, it, it increases the breadth of virus activated genes. Uh, tetherin is like a staple that goes inside of the uh, bilayer of the cell so that as viruses try to aggress, they end up being aggregated together. And things like fast ligand, which in course and just induce apoptosis as kind of a last resort to deal with the infection. And so the call to arms is really meant to just slow the infection down because the innate immune response for most viruses is probably not going to be sufficient to completely neutralize the infection. And that's where we have the call for reinforcements. And so the same transcription factors that are trying to um, call, uh, I mean, are, are trying to reinforce the cellular defenses around them, they're also releasing a wide variety of other pro-inflammatory cytokines as well as chemokines whose uh, function it is to recruit monocytes, uh, lymphocytes, uh, and other antigen presenting cells, um, pro-inflammatory uh, cells, all to the site of infection because this response, the adaptive response, is ultimately what's going to be needed to not only clear the infection, clear the dead and dying debris that is at the site of infection, but of course also to then generate antibodies so that you can have lifelong immunity to whatever caused this problem in the first place. All right, so let's get to the data. So that's, that's in a nutshell what is supposed to happen uh, in response to virus biology in general. Um, and so uh, working on SARS was a new one for us. So my lab doesn't focus on one particular virus. We, uh, we have, uh, I think, over 30 different viruses in the lab that we like to work with, and we study really the host response. Um, but beta coronaviruses were new to us. Um, and so we started off by working with um, A549 cells. Uh, it was quite clear um, from the literature, both from SARS-CoV-1 literature and, and, uh, and other studies, that um, A549s were actually a poor uh, model for SARS-CoV-2 because they lacked ACE2 expression. Um, so we've generated A549 ACE2 cells, both by Lenti and by uh, vector-mediated uh, expression. And if you put ACE2 into these cells, uh, we can achieve, um, you can see here by us, uh, spike staining that we can increase the percent of virus infected cells uh, in, a, in an MOI specific manner. So this is multiplicity of infection. So a multiplicity of infection of one, for example, just means we're theoretically adding one infectious plaque forming unit per one cell. Um, the reason why it doesn't really necessarily work out that way in part is because when we calculate plaques, we do it in Vero cells. Uh, and then when we infect with A549s, it's not necessarily a guarantee um, that they're going to be um, comparable. But in any case, you can see that as you increase the number of PFU you add, you increase the number of infected cells. So that's, that's good. All right. Uh, okay, so um, just to, to kind of get us started, uh, this is gonna be a lot of sequencing data, uh, mostly because we, we do like to do a lot of deep sequencing in the lab here. We have our own uh, high seek or next seek machine, sorry. Uh, and so what you're looking at here, this is just simply taking SARS-CoV-2. This is the Wuhan strain that's offered on BEI resources. And we simply first threw it onto A549 cells without any ACE2 expression. Um, what you're looking at here is essentially a histogram that is looking at reads in, everything is always done in triplicate samples. And you're looking at reads that map across the near 30,000 bases that comprise uh, 
this RNA virus genome. Um, and really, um, while it is clear that you're getting some virus um, into these cells, uh, A549s, because they lack ACE2, uh, this really is a, is a poor substitute for virus infection. And you can tell that by simply adding ACE2 back into these cells, and you can see that our, our depth of coverage and our just total number of reads captured uh, increases by more than two orders of magnitude. Um, so what, what's quite interesting here, though, is um, so here, these are A549s that are expressing M. cherry as our control. And so you can see that in the lack of ACE2, we have kind of just a low grade virus infection. Um, it's unclear how this virus gets in, but it's probably some spontaneous activation during culturing viros that allow just a few virions to get in. It could be a few cells that sporadically have enough ACE on their ACE2 on their surface to get in. But the addition of ACE2 certainly uh, allows for robust virus replication in these systems. Um, one of the things that's quite interesting is that if you look at the reads of this, which are all available on NCBI Geo, this virus uh, accumulates to near 50% of total viral reads, which is incredibly high. It is higher than, than any virus that, that we generally work with here in the lab. Um, and um, what's more is that if you increase the MOI by an order of magnitude, uh, you don't actually see more replication, suggesting that um, uh, it really is uh, replicating at, at its most optimal in, in this particular cell system. So a 549s expressing ACE2 do seem to be a robust system in order to study the biology, which is good because uh, it's going to be our model moving forward. However, one of the interesting things that came out very early on in this data was, um, so this is a heat map of, again, it's always triplicate samples where each lane represents essentially three biological replicates infected against three biological replicates uninfected. Uh, the quality of the sequencing is very good. Everything has over 10 million reads per sample. Uh, the statistics are very strong. And what I just really want you to gain from this, because it's a, it's a lot of data, these things. But so this, these are CalU3 cells here. So this is also a human lung cancer line, very much like A549s. Um, and if you add CalU3 cells, which grow terribly, they're not, they don't transfect well, they don't expand well, and that's why you don't see them a lot in the literature. They're very difficult to work with. You do see a, a very robust interferon signature. So this would be the call to arms over here and a really robust uh, cytokine signature over here. So in CalU3 cells, it would appear like the cell is having its way with the virus and you're getting a, a pretty canonical response to infection. Um, of course, you lose all of this in A549s, mostly because you just don't have a lot of virus replication. And so you don't really have an interferon response here and you don't have the call to arms. That's, that's perhaps not surprising. The, the part that was particularly interesting early on is comparing these two guys. So the one with the asterisk here, this is a low MOI of 0.2 for 24 hours post-infection. So plenty of, the time, plenty of time for the virus to expand and grow. But I hope that you can appreciate that uh, very much like in the slide I just showed you, despite the fact that replication levels are, are spot on comparable to each other. In the low MOI infection, we have a complete absence of the interferon signature Whereas by uh, increasing by an order of magnitude, we now can see both type one and type three interferon, suggesting that the engagement of interferon itself is somehow MOI dependent. Um, so um, part of that actually is um, um, perhaps not surprising because uh, as you can imagine that if you increase your MOI, you're going to increase the likelihood that the virus starts making mistakes because jumping into the uh, switch between early replication and these production of the anti-genome is largely dependent on uh, a timing event as the virus gets in. So if, as you increase MOI, you are going to enter this phase probably earlier than you were meant to, and maybe more importantly, earlier than you've had time to accumulate some of your accessory proteins. And so by increasing the MOI, you're gonna increase PAMP production, perhaps in the absence of the time needed it is to antagonize this process, which would explain why at a high MOI, you might see activation of all these guys, whereas at a low MOI, the virus remains uh, relatively silent in the department of interferon induction. And so we can in fact see this by, by deep sequencing. This is simply a volcano plot. And I've always tried to add him a little cartoon of what cells I'm talking about down here, because this is going to change quite often. Um, and so in this volcano plot, what you're looking at is uh, differentially expressed genes, again, between triplicate infected samples and triplicate uninfected samples. Uh, and these are all the ones that meet uh, high significance that, that we can talk about them as being differentially expressed. 
And uh, really, all, the only real take home I want you to get here is that at a high MOI, again, we can see um, both the, the call for reinforcements like CCL2 here, uh, IL6, CXCL5, and CXCL1. These are all things that are going to induce a pro-inflammatory response and bring in the adaptive response to the site of infection. But we also see some classic interferon-stimulated genes like OAS2 and IFIT1. Um, however, as an example, IFIT1 is one of those genes that can also just be induced directly by the IRF. So seeing this on a, on a gene chart, as well as OAS2 for that matter, does not necessarily mean that this was induced by interferon, but at least by the activation of some IRF in the system. So what we've done then is we take these cells and we knock out MAB. So if you remember correctly, um, Let's go back for a second. So if we knock out this guy, it shouldn't really matter if we produce PAMPs because canonically everything is going to shuttle through this particular bottleneck in MABS and we would expect all of those things to go away. And in fact, that is what we see. So if you go from this being your typical A54, A549 response at high MOI and then you take away MABS, you lose that gene induction and all of those genes now end up uh, on, the, on the left side of the panel. So in, in, in contrast, now they, they appear to be downregulated because they're all lost. So they're no longer being induced if you lose MAPS. And again, this is very canonical uh, cellular antiviral biology 101. Um, interestingly, if we knock out either MDA5, so that's one of the pattern recognition receptors that likes long double-stranded RNA, and we compare it against RIGI, the pattern recognition receptor that likes the uh, five prime exposed triphosphates or the, the diphosphates, uh, you can immediately appreciate which is the pattern recognition receptor for this particular virus. So again, here you see a very robust response of, of different ISGs and different chemokines in the RIGI null cells, but in the MDA5 cells, essentially it looks transcriptionally silent. We do see a lot of the chemokines that are, uh, that are quite typical of a SARS-CoV-2 infection, but none of the ISGs in the absence of MDA5, really suggesting that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it is uh, the essentially the accidental production of double-stranded RNA before the virus has a chance to counteract that detection or that signaling that results in all of these genes over here that you see in red. Okay, so that's um, uh, the, the differential between high MOI and low MOI and A549s, but, but what do we actually see? And, and does the virus actually um, uh, antagonize this response? And so one of the first things we did was simply ask, does does interferon actually stop virus infection? And the answer to that is clearly yes. Um, so these are Vero cells uh, and all they simply did, so Vero's are African green monkey cells. They don't produce their own interferon. They're missing the chromosome that uh, encodes for interferon. And so here what you can do is you can add in exogenously universal interferon that, that works in Vero cells. Uh, and you can appreciate the virus here replicates very robustly as determined by uh, quantitative PCR for either the E transcript or the NSP14 transcript. And if you add in interferon even an hour into an infection, you completely shut down that infection, um, largely suggesting that in, at least in Vero cells, this virus is sensitive to interferon and thus kind of begging the question, you know, why is this virus a problem at all if, um, if it's sensitive to the very defenses we have? And, you know, the long story short here is that I'm going to show you that the virus actually produces very little interferon and the interferon it does produce, it, it, it seems to antagonize that biology when, uh, when left to its own devices. All right, so uh, another experiment here is um, we simply ask the question, does blocking interferon enhance virus replication? So we go back to A549-ACE2 cells and now we're gonna add a drug. So this uh, roxalitinib uh, is a, ja a very potent JAK kinase inhibitor. Um, so if you remember, um, this is once interferon has been released, uh, the activation of that ISGF3 complex that's responsible for many of the canonical interferon stimulated genes um, re requires uh, JAK kinase activation. So this drug should short circuit interferon signaling. And in fact, we do see that. So if you just simply look at uh, this line here, you would expect this dotted line to be where we, we should see all the interferon stimulated genes. And you can see that it drops out over here, suggesting that the drug is working very nicely and we are losing the interferon response because we blocked JAK1 function. And then we simply throw virus into these conditions and ask the question, does SARS-CoV-2 do better in the presence of this drug, which would presumably allow the virus to replicate uninhibited against all the ISGs that the cell would naturally form? 
And the answer to that question is the resounding no. Um, the virus really doesn't care about whether or not you inhibit uh, JAK kinase or not. And this again speaks to the fact that the reason it doesn't matter is because under physiological conditions, as you're going to see, interferon levels are kept very low and the interferon that does signal uh, appears to be very potently blocked by that virus. So another way to look at this uh, same experiment is to simply compare what the transcriptome looks like when you add interferon versus what you, uh, happens when you add just simply SARS-CoV-2. So again, these are A549 ACE2 cells. And if you just simply add A5 interferon to these cells, uh, you get a, you know, a very strong induction of interferon stimulated genes. Now, if SARS-CoV-2 induced that same interferon response, you would expect all these blue lines, each of which represents the significant a gene that reaches significance from triplicate deep sequencing reads, you would expect them to all climb up this line beautifully as a, as a cor correlative. Um, but in fact, the reason you see uh, all these genes down here is that basically the movement of all these blue lines going down into this direction is the difference between what SARS-CoV-2 actually does to a cell and what interferon would like to do to a cell. Again, kind of a, another indirect way of demonstrating that SARS-CoV-2 under normal circumstances is inducing very low levels of interferon and is actively suppressing any signaling that interferon is meant to be uh, generating. All right, again, this is the same message. It's again in a different cell. These are just, we're just going through homogeneous cultures here. Um, so now we've departed from the kind of cancerous continuous cell lines that grow well on plastic to these uh, normal human bronchial epithelial cells. So these are bronchial cells from, uh, from, from humans. They're primary cells. They, they only have so many passages in them. And here I wanted to just to compare how SARS-CoV-2 contrasts between either the treatment of interferon alone, an infection with a different respiratory virus. So in this case, we have influenza. And then just as a, um, uh, uh, an interesting comparison, the same virus, so influenza A virus, but one, so there's Delta lacking NS1. So NS1 is the antagonist of flu. And so if you wanted to see how potent a respiratory virus can stop this, uh, this natural defense of the cells, you can compare flu to a flu that lacks NS1. And this, this work really comes out of this department from Adolfo Garcia Sastre's group and Peter Palazzi's group, and it's a really nice model system. And so again, all I really want to impress upon you here is how white uh, this SARS-CoV-2 line is both on the top and on the bottom. So on the bottom here, you really see that SARS-CoV-2 replication in these NHPE cells is really not inducing the interferon response. So here's interferon and you see basically a pink line that runs all the way across, suggesting that all of these genes are induced by uh, interferon signaling. Um, and you can see that SARS-CoV-2, that same line is all white, suggesting that these genes are not being induced, again, either because they're stopping interferon or they are stopping the signaling of interferon or both. And just as a contrast, you can see that flu, flu actually ends up allowing the cell to induce more of the antiviral response than say SARS-CoV-2 does. But if you take away flu's antagonist, NS1 over here, you see a much more predominant, oops, much more predominant um, response. And that is, this is basically flu without any breaks, just hitting every tripwire of the cell and you get a very, very strong response um, because this virus produces so much PAM. Um, one other point I'd like to make with this, cell, this, uh, this figure though, is that if you look to the top, even though you see no interferon signature from SARS-CoV-2, we still, even under these exact same conditions, we maintain a lot of the pro-inflammatory uh, cytokines and chemokines that we spoke about earlier. And this really just goes to this overall message that while we lack the, uh, the robust interferon response that we're supposed to see, we for some reason still maintain a lot of the pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines in response to SARS-CoV-2. And this really does mimic what we're going to see with COVID-19 patients. And so this is really like the, the continuing theme that you're going to see throughout. All right, so uh, what's doing that blocking? Uh, I know that this is a, an area of research that's being pursued by many people, including us. Um, there are already a number of reports out. And in, overall, it looks like many of the, the antagonists that are utilized by SARS-CoV-2 are either similar or identical to those that have been characterized for SARS-CoV-1, which isn't particularly surprising given their, their homology. And so in red here, are, these are all the different open reading frames of SARS-CoV-1 that have been described 
to block either pattern recognition receptors signaling to MAVs, the uh, kinase activations of either IR3 or NF-kappa B, the translocation of either IR3 or NF-kappa B, that's just for the primary induction of interferon. And then with interferon signaling, there is also um, the report that SP1 can, uh, can uh, degrade uh, ISGF3 and ORF6 is thought to block the translocation of this ISGF3 complex into the nucleus. So you can appreciate that if the virus replicates slowly and does not produce double-stranded RNA early on in an infection and has the time to make all of these accessory proteins, then by the time PAMPs start to form, which are going to naturally happen as the virus accumulates, it will have little consequence because the virus will have short-circuited much of what the cell wanted to do in the first place. So that's uh, the conclusions for this first part. Um, so at low MOIs, we observe chemokine induction, but really little interferon induction. And I, and I think that's for the reasons I just explained that the virus needs a bit of time to make the, um, the accessory proteins that are responsible for blocking much of what will inevitably uh, be induced when PAMPs start forming. When you move to higher MOIs, you artificially induce those PAMPs early on and therefore you get both chemokines and interferons. If you pre-treat with interferon uh, and you allow the cells to fortify, those cells do become resistant to virus infection, um, um, which you know, is a little unfair of a comparison because that, that means that if you allow the cells to bring in all of their heavy hitting equipment for blocking entry, blocking translation, blocking transcription, then you can actually inhibit virus infection. Um, but the truth is, is that very, this probably doesn't matter very much physiologically because clearly the virus has a capacity to manipulate all these different systems. Um, I did want to throw in one last thing with regards to homogeneous tissues, um, and that is we've also just done some basic transcriptional profiling of some non-respiratory cells. I thought talking to Janelia, they would appreciate some uh, neuronal uh, angle to all of this. Uh, so we did do uh, an infection. Again, this is just triplicate infected cells versus uninfected cells, and we did motor neurons, microglia, and um, cardiomyocytes. And um, here what you see is basically uh, a reflection of how much ACE2 is on the receptor. So microglia, we see very little ACE, if any. And so this really looks like that first A549 infection that we saw. So you get, you get viral reads, you get coverage across the genome, but you get very abortive replication. And most of the cells probably are not infected. And as a result, we see a bit of a chemokine signature, but it's relatively weak uh, and not a lot happening in microglia, um, which is probably comparable to, to macrophages as well, that cells like these, you know, um, professional antigen presenting cells are also very good at sequestering virus and blocking replication. But in contrast, both motor neurons and cardiomyocytes, they, they do very well at both enabling viral entry and um, inducing a, a robust transcriptional response. Uh, but again, very consistently here, we see the, the you know, quote unquote, call for reinforcements. We see those cytokines, we see pro-inflammatory um, uh, markers, we see chemokines, um, but we see very little interferon stimulated genes. We see no interferon reads directly. And you know, the closest you can see that there's like an IFIT1 here. But again, remember that IFIT1 are one of those genes that can be directly activated by say IRF3 or IRF1. So you don't actually need interferon signaling to get you know, the few genes that show up here. Um, so just as a, oh, you know what? As I'm looking at this, I think I must have accidentally pasted this graph twice, but cardiomyocytes look the same, but they're not that identical. Uh, sorry, that, that was my mistake. Uh, okay, so um, SARS-CoV-2 and mixed cell cultures. All right, so, you know, take home of that is really that if you take these, these, uh, these cell cultures that replication is essentially kind of uh, synced together and that's why you go high MOI, you get early PAM production and interferon and maybe the cell gets the leading uh, the hand in this war against virus and host. Whereas at a lower MOI and the virus can replicate um, without any interference from itself, you get very little PAM production uh, you get robust replication and um, the time you need to make the accessory proteins to block the host defenses when you start making uh, actual PAMP. But what happens when in a more physiological setting when it's not a single cell and you don't have a um, uh, uh, synchronized infection? So we went into cell uh, organoid cultures and 
this was uh, has been an amazing collaboration with um, Cornell Group. Uh, so this is Xu Bing Chen and Rob Schwartz. Uh, and uh, this has been a very productive collaboration. So um, both uh, the Xu Bing's lab and Rob's lab, uh, they are, um, uh, I don't know how they would categorize themselves, I guess, kind of a, a fusion between uh, developmental biologists, uh, stem cell biologists, and, and a, a little virology mixed in. But they take human pluripotent stem cells, so primary stem cells, and they have the capacity to differentiate them into uh, all these different lineages uh, in a dish. Um, and basically what they've been providing for us is they provide the, uh, a variety of these different organoids to us. So they are composed of different numbers of cells. So I think, um, and I'm sorry, Rob, if you're watching, I might butcher this, but cardiomyocyte cultures, I believe are like three different cell types, whereas say lung organoids are 15 different cell types. So they range in complexity depending on uh, what kind of organoid they are, but they are all mixed cultures. And that's kind of the next thing we wanted to check. All right, so let's start. This is our uh, lung organoids, arguably um, the, uh, the most relevant of the, the organoid cultures. Um, so they're, they're pictured down here. Uh, we, we can observe that we get a, a good infection of them. They express high levels of ACE2. Um, and we can see uh, the, the spike protein here in green. Uh, we get uh, engagement of virus. We get entry of virus. We get replication of virus. Um, and if we map this again across the genome, we can appreciate that we have full genomic coverage. Uh, and the spike here, I get a lot of questions about this spike here. They're probably there for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that the uh, reverse transcription reaction itself uh, has to try and span this entire region. So we do end up with a, a bias over here. This is also poly A signaling. So we're always grabbing the poly A tail on the end. And then of course, all the accessory proteins are all embedded in this little region over here. So we do have a lot of mRNAs with this uh, that will map over here. Um, if we look transcriptionally at how these organoids respond to virus, um, again, uh, this looks a lot like what we viewed at with the homogeneous cell culture. So again, we see a lot of pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines and uh, a complete absence of type one or type three interferon with just a sprinkling of interferon stimulated genes, which overlap probably more with the direct activation of IRFs and less to do with actual interferon signaling. All right, then if we try, uh, say, colon organoids, for example. So um, in the colon organoid, there's been a lot of reports that SARS CoV 2 can cause uh, a number of GI complications. Uh, and in looking at both these cultures and many others, uh, including many publications that are on bioarchive and, and published in peer reviewed journals, we do see that they express a lot of ACE2 uh, and they are very permissive to virus replication. So we see very robust rep replication in these organoids. Uh, and again, uh, if you simply take those organoids, infect them and uh, sequence them, you get complete coverage of the viral genome and it appears that the virus is replicating quite well, even in these heterogeneous populations. Um, looking again at the uh, transcriptional response to these, uh, I think you can appreciate um, very much like every other volcano plot I've showed you, we see pro-inflammatory cytokines, here's IL-1 alpha, here's IL-1 beta, and then we have this mix of different uh, chemokines, so uh, CXCL6, 8, and 11, which are going to be responsible amongst other things for bringing in monocytes, macrophages, leukocytes, neutrophils, all of the things that um, are meant to kind of clean up the site of infection and start generating an adaptive immune response um, by grabbing antigens at the site of infection. All right, so um, if we compare our homogeneous cells to our organoids, I think we can appreciate that um, they're really not all that different actually. Um, but we do consistently see that we have this high cytokine expression with undetectable levels of type 1 or type 3 interferon, but we do see some ISGs. And so um, for those of you who work on interferon, um, detecting interferon by RNA sequencing can be difficult sometimes, although, uh, I mean, given our depth, we should see it. Um, but we can't rule out that there's some low level of interferon in these cultures that's probably uh, inducing some of this response. Um, but some of it is also the direct activation of those IRFs I mentioned earlier. All right, so we go from homogeneous cells to organoid models, and now we're going to go into animals to see how, uh, if this all holds true in animals. Um, so this is our, these are ferrets. Um, so this was done with uh, in large help from a professor here named Randy Albrecht uh, and his postdoctoral um, scholar, uh, uh, Claire. And so here what we're looking at are uh, 
uh, I think three ferrets per time point, and we're simply inoculating these ferrets intranasally with uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, I think it's 10 to the 5 PFU per animal. Uh, and what we're simply doing is we're measuring, uh, in this particular case, we're measuring viral reads from the nasal wash. So these animals are put under light anesthetic and they are uh, given essentially a 1 ml uh, PBS squirt up a nostril. Uh, and when that PBS uh, is collected, uh, it, it leaves a pellet behind, which is a pellet of cells that include like endothelial cells, a few pneumocytes, things that have shed off from the, the nasal passage. And we simply sequence those in bulk. Uh, we have tried to do single cell sequencing on these cultures, uh, but uh, that uh, turns out there's just not enough material to do that. But what you can appreciate just by reads here is that on day one, that's this gray line. You can see that we have very low levels of our, um, our virus. We don't even have full coverage here. But by day three, now we have full coverage. So we're getting the blue line all the way across the genome. And by day seven, these are at, now at its peak. So we see now complete coverage and it's at its highest levels as far as total read numbers go for a virus infection. And then by day 14, so a week after that, it becomes completely undetectable, which is depicted here by this green line at the bottom. Uh, and so ferrets really, uh, these are uh, six week old ferrets uh, and they really represent essentially teenagers. And so in reality, this model for virus replication really does resemble a pretty typical teenager getting SARS-CoV-2 in that they are permissive to infection. Uh, I'm told they cough a little bit, uh, they have rising titers, but then they quickly clear the virus and are completely uh, recovered by, by two weeks. So if you take again those, the, those pellets of nasal washes that we can uh, retrieve and simply do again transcriptomics on them, you see very little happening on day one. On day three, we begin to see again this uh, induction of chemokines. So very much like organoids, very much like our homogeneous cell culture systems. Uh, this also seems to hold true here. And then following viral titers, we see the most impressive transcriptional movement on day seven, where you see really the the, the who's who of the, the chemokine list in here. And, and um, these, this is just a very small subset of genes uh, being depicted here. And then by day 14, um, the uh, transcriptional response is, is largely calming down. Uh, we do see uh, a remaining significant upregulation in IL-6, which uh, will become relevant when we look at the COVID-19 patients, as well as what's been observed clinically in the, in the real world. Uh, and then we have this one marker, which is kind of an interesting one. So it's IL-1-RN. It's actually an antagonist to IL-1, but it is transcriptionally uh, regulated with IL-1. So IL-1-RN in some ways is also uh, a proxy for IL-1 itself, uh, which is why we included it here. Um, it was also noted to be upregulated both in SARS-CoV-1 and in MERS transcriptional work. So it does seem to be a very consistent marker for the induction of at least these three um, these three different uh, pathogenic coronaviruses. Um, if we go back to ferrets, and so as I was mentioning in the very beginning of this conference that, um, let's make sure the time is here, uh, the very beginning of this conference that we, we do a lot of flu work, and if you compare what happens to in, in the, this is the trachea, if you compare what happens in the trachea transcriptionally to flu versus SARS, you can appreciate that a lot of the pro-inflammatory cytokines, there's definitely some interferon signature in this mix, but largely it's shared, right? All the genes are generally red and the, the ferrets are responding to it, uh, to both viruses in a re relatively comparable manner. But there is this one block of genes here that is very specific to our ferrets in response to SARS that is missing in response to flu. And while we're not entirely clear what this is, if you grab the genes that comprise this block and put them through a number of different prediction programs, the one we liked was called ImGen, it's a publicly available uh, product that allows you to kind of, what it, what it looks for is unique genes that help define particular cell types or cell lineages. Uh, what you can appreciate are all the bars that are going well over our, our zero line here are showing enrichment in these particular cell types. And you'd have to, I mean, this goes into pretty heavy immunology that go well over my head. But uh, if you go back into the publications from here, it will explain what all of these different acronyms mean. Uh, but basically they're different lineage tracings of various lymphocytes, uh, monocytes, uh, and different adaptive immune cells. And what we're seeing is really an enrichment of the progenitors uh, for hemopoietic cells, which um, it does introduce this exciting idea that the SARS-CoV-2 might actually be inducing 
some kind of uh, hematopoiesis inside of, at the site of infection, which is again, consistent with some of the complications and things observed in response to actual virus. Um, so with regards to ferrets, um, they, uh, you know, overall, we, we didn't really learn a lot from them in that they don't develop COVID-19. So we don't see a lot of disease. We see a little bit of infiltration. We see this interesting uh, hemopoietic progenitor marker. But overall, they're a great model just for looking at virus replication in a living system. So they're, they're good for, for testing repurposed FDA drugs, which is something we're actively doing in collaboration with the Weiss Institute and the University of Maryland. Um, uh, with the support of DARPA. Um, but as far as modeling COVID-19, um, it's unclear how much value they have because I think they are essentially young teenage ferrets. And so we'd really have to start looking at uh, ferrets that were aged um, or maybe hamsters, which is the other uh, animal model that works well in this to see if COVID-19, meaning like respiratory distress in the lung develops in older animals. And so just to end, I just wanted to talk about uh, how this compares to COVID-19 patients. Uh, I'm gonna cover this uh, quickly because uh, the data sets that we had to work with are, are, are very small and, and pale in comparison to some of the other data that's out there. Um, so we did get um, from, um, um, from our Cornell collaborators, um, some lung from COVID-19 patients that had passed uh, that enabled us to sequence them. Um, because this was formal and fixed, so sequencing data was not uh, as great as we would have liked it. Um, but again, here we observe uh, the typical uh, response to virus infection, so a collection of the call for reinforcement. So again, we see chemokines, we see pro-inflammatory cytokines, and here we do see some uh, evidence of interferon. So while IFID2 and IFID-M3 can be induced by IRF. The MX gene here in particular is thought to be a gene that is exclusively induced into interferon, suggesting that there must be some interferon in some patients. And so this is the data from, from two patients uh, that we deep sequence. These are from two different patients, in fact. And in these ones, we could actually confirm that we could not see interferon beta by qPCR. So it does suggest that if it is there, it is incredibly low. So you might see the signature of MX, which is a, a very stable and long-lived both RNA and protein. But interferon beta um, and interferon lambda, kind of its partner in crime, uh, must be incredibly low in these systems. And this has actually been played out by a number of other groups. So uh, this is from MedArchive. Um, and in this group, they were suggesting that the severity of disease really maps well to interferon. So both here, they're measuring interferon alpha 2, that um, basically, depending on what, what spectrum of disease you fall under, really determines how much interferon you have. But the truth is in both of these cases, the, the types of interferon they're looking at and the ISGs they're looking at, this response is really diminished in comparison to what you would see with something say like influenza. And this, um, this is further corroborated um, in, in our own work. Um, so we had, uh, we did uh, through the collaboration with Stanford uh, through Tai Wong, we got a number of serum samples from individuals that uh, went into hospital with uh, respiratory distress that either tested positive for COVID-19 are essentially tested negative for COVID-19. And so uh, it's an important to remember that the individuals here in black, and uh, I forget the number, I think it's 26 in each category. Um, these people also came in sick with something. So these are not a healthy cohort we're comparing it to. We're comparing to uh, you know, a, a SARS-CoV-2 infection to some other type of infection. Um, and so these uh, ELISAs were performed by Gene Lim here in our department. And we can see that uh, really there's not a lot of interferon beta. Again, interferon beta is, is a tough one to detect. So there's just this one individual in our control group who tested positive. Uh, and in Lambda, we see nothing. So we really see, again, very low levels of interferon, if at all, uh, existing uh, amongst at least uh, these particular patients. However, um, again, very consistent with what we've seen both in cell lines and in organoids and in ferrets. Uh, we do see uh, a very uh, elevated level of chemokines and cytokines. So here's a list of chemokines that are going to be responsible for recruiting a lot of those adaptive responses. And we see a significant elevation in COVID-19 patients for all three of these. Uh, in addition to, here's our friend IL-6. Here's IL-1RA, which is the equivalent of IL-1RN that we see in ferrets, the same gene, just a different name. Uh, and you can see this is I mean, they're not all the COVID-19 patients, so maybe there's something unique about these. I have no information beyond that they tested positive for COVID and these people tested negative. But you can see that this is a very, very uh, unique marker for um, SARS-CoV-2. Um, uh, and here again, IL-1 beta, 
uh, is elevated. Uh, so it's not significantly different between what we see in these, these other patients, but this level of, of cytokine in the serum is in fact a uh, high. So you do see high L1 beta, IL-1 RA, which is supposed to be transcriptionally regulated with beta, and in fact, uh, high IL-6, which is um, uh, now being targeted uh, therapeutically in a number of hospitals worldwide. And the truth is that this entire um, observation is very aligned with what's known for SARS-CoV-1. So if I had to conclude this entire talk, it's really that, you know, I feel like I've already said it 20 times, that SARS-CoV-2 replication it induces this really strong call for reinforcements with a really weak call to arms. And ultimately, this leads to this pro-inflammatory uh, environment that, that really uh, doesn't clear and, and the disease is spread out over you know, a two-week time span. And this is almost identical to what uh, Stan Perlman observed uh, with SARS-CoV-1, that basically the worst thing you can have is this like low-level um, half-hearted interferon response because it allows the virus titers to, to reach higher levels than they should. And because that response is so weak, it's not an effective response to clear it. And so the virus persists for long periods of time, allowing for this disease and this, this cytokine storm, if you will, to, to uh, enter into this feed forward loop to have very little resolution. And so really, we're really seeing this uh, scenario in SARS-CoV-2, just like uh, Stan observed in, in SARS-CoV-1. And so that's, the, that's my talk for today. Um, I should say that I haven't picked up a pipette in a very long time. And this has been this amazing collaboration with all these individuals you see here. Um, my team, I know I can speak to, have been working uh, 14 hour days, seven days a week, as has uh, Rob Schwartz's and Chu Bing's lab. Uh, and they're just an amazing group of people uh, that have really put together some really high quality data in, in record time. So I thank them all uh, for making this possible. And uh, with that, um, I'm happy to take some questions. I should thank my supporters, uh, my collaborators. Uh, and if you're interested in any of this data, it is all on uh, NCBI Geo at the accession number you see there. The end. Awesome, Ben. That, that was amazing. And as predicted, we have um, a load of good questions for you here. All right. Um, and uh, yeah, you, you actually, you answered a lot of them as, as we went, um, but we've got some really provocative ones left. Um, first one I'm going to pitch you is, uh, th there are a lot of questions about the, um, the role of the ACE2 primary receptor and uh, how that if that creates uh, positive or negative feedback loops with this. Uh, so uh, specifically, um, uh, you know, is ACE2 getting up or down regulated in, in this process? Yeah, that, that's a really tough question. There, there's been some really great uh, single cell reporting on ACE2 being an interferon stimulated gene. Um, I do have to say that if you look at the data on GEO, uh, especially the data in uh, NHBAs or A549s, we do see that ACE2 uh, is induced in response to human parainfluenza virus. It's induced in response to influenza virus. But in response to SARS-CoV-2, we actually see it go down. Um, and so that is in contradiction to a number of reports that have been out there, um, but a lot of them are really looking at the addition of interferon and not so much virus infection. So my guess is that the virus is probably preventing the uh, amount of interferon that's secreted to actually induce that induction. So I don't think it's playing, I don't, I don't think it's playing a role based on what we see. We don't see it upregulated in ferrets. We don't see it upregulated in, um, um, in uh, our cell lines and we don't see it upregulated in organoids. So um, in response to virus. So it, it's hard to imagine. It's, I mean, it's certainly possible that, so later on in infection, things get very messy in an in vivo situation because as cells start dying, a lot of the PAMPs that may have formed in that cell, which perhaps weren't being, uh, were being blocked uh, in the process of inducing, say, interferon, are now spilling out into the, the cellular milieu. And um, because there are toll-like receptors around at that time of infection, um, you know, things like dendritic cells can certainly pick up those PAMPs. And there you're going to get some interferon induction that has nothing to do with virus, right? The virus didn't have a chance to block that. 
And so the interferon that you see in vivo likely comes from, say, dendritic cells that are brought to the site of infection well into it and are very independent from like the replication phase. And so it's unclear whether or not that interferon signaling onto a completely uninfected cell, there you might see some ACE2 upregulation, um, which may increase the capacity of the virus to then enter that cell. Um, but we don't see it in our data, but it's possible. Yeah, and then so there's a second half to that question um, uh, specific to interferon gamma. Uh, so this is from uh, Charles Zucker and myself. Um, Charles noted that interferon gamma application uh, seems to upregulate ACE2. And, but then when you were talking, I Googled and I saw that, that for SARS-1, it was thought to downregulate ACE2. Do, do, you, do you know what interferon gamma is doing? So, so interferon, so the short answer is no. Uh, I do know that SARS-CoV-1, I, I saw a talk and his name escapes me now, he's in Vancouver. He's the, actually the guy that discovered ACE2 and he gave a talk at the New York Genome Center last week. And he clearly showed that if you add SARS-CoV-1 to infected cells by Western blot, ACE2 disappears, which is consistent with what we see in our data. So it would suggest it actually goes down. But again, to your point, like interferon gamma, I view it more as a, as a T cell kind of adaptive immune response interferon. And so while the virus, uh, we do see the induction of interferon gamma in vivo, um, the signaling where ACE2 would, be, would go up in response to say STAT1 dimers, which is what interferon gamma creates, um, I would think that that again would be retained to only cells that weren't infected. And I don't think that PBMCs get infected very well. So that's, you might see an ACE2 upregulation in cells that are, are you know, um, on the periphery of infection, not necessarily involved in the infection. Yeah. Um, okay, so second um, really good question we have is, and, and you showed some data about this, um, you didn't use the phrase um, host restriction factor. So um, uh, you showed that IFIT and IFIT-M, Tetherin in particular, are um, uh, res known restriction factors for coronaviruses, and you see those also for SARS-CoV-2. Um, th there is um, a lot of chatter about APABEC-3 being a potential restriction factor. Uh, it's not historically known as a restriction factor for coronaviruses. It's more retroviruses, herpes virus, hepatinovirus, et cetera. Um, what, what do you think? Do you think APOBEC3 is getting, is trying to take this thing down? Good question. Uh, again, the short answer is I don't know. I can tell you that uh, we've had a lot of interest in ADAR. Um, and early on, we did overexpress ADAR in A549 cells and infected them to see if ADAR was hypermutating the virus. And we saw zero evidence that that happened. Um, that doesn't mean that APOBEC's not doing it, but it, it does suggest that the virus may sequester its genome to protect it, protect it from RNA editing. Uh, maybe the nucleocapsid plays a role in preventing that from happening. Maybe ADAR is just different than APOBEC. Uh, so the answer is I don't know, but we haven't seen any evidence of it. Like I find it quite extraordinary. If you sequence the virus from our New York patients and reassemble it de novo, the sequence is, is near identical to like what came out of Wuhan in December or to our virus from cell culture. So like it's not, it's not showing a lot of signs of, of uh, nucleotide substitutions or mutations. Like yes, there are a few, but they are a few and far between. Well, well, y yes and no. I mean, you know, so GSIAD is doing a good job and next strain, you know, I think we're approaching about 8,000 sequence genomes at this point. And um, I mean, this is all wildly controversial about the role of specific mutations. There's, I'm forgetting the exact number. Yes, yes, I know what you're talking about, yes. Yeah, that, I mean, that, that, still out of a gene of 30,000, like if you compare it to flu or human parainfluenza virus or measles virus, like you yeah. passage those viruses a few times and you're, you're gonna see a sprinkling of, of minority variants appear all over the genome. We do not, I mean, it's very clear that these viruses have a good proofreading ability and yeah. minimize the number of mutations. So 
I, I hear your point and it, sh it certainly could be true. Um, I just think that for a 30,000 base pair RNA virus, it's amazing how little changes. Um, but yes, I, I don't know the answer to your question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Britt, who gave, Britt uh, Glonsinger, who gave the first lecture, uh, showed that the, the XON domain was a pretty darn good proofreader. Yeah. Um, but yeah and I've, I've seen bandied about um, one third as much uh, mutations as influenza. Yeah, but, there's a paper where they, um, from SARS-CoV-1, and I'm sorry, I don't remember who did it exactly, probably Ralph Barrett but they added in ribavirin, which is a nucleoside analog, which yep. generally causes kind of replication catastrophe for all RNA viruses. Uh, and basically, uh, SARS-CoV-1 was completely resistant to it, again, because it has this capacity to just replicate very slowly and carefully. Uh, it also doesn't produce nearly as many defective viral genomes as you see with any other RNA virus. Like it's a, it's a careful virus, which is probably why at low MRIs, you really don't see engagement of the interferon system because it's not making those sloppy mistakes that you often see with all the other RNA viruses that you know play more of the speed game. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let's see. Um, so many good questions to choose from here. Um, okay. So um, Darcy asks, um, why, why didn't you do the hamsters instead of the ferrets? Uh, good question. We have hamsters are coming on Tuesday. Uh, we, we are adapting to the hamster model. Um, I, for, for any of those who know me, like we, we do a lot of flu work here. Uh, and so we had ferrets in the BSL-3. We have a IACUC protocol for ferrets. And so we started with ferrets. Uh, ferrets are a really nice model uh, for this. I, I wasn't trying to uh, diminish their value. Uh, I was just saying it would be nice if they developed COVID-19 disease in their lung. Uh, but I don't think hamsters do either. Uh, we'll know next week. Uh, from what I understand, based on the published literature, that we see, you see a little bit higher replication in the lung of hamsters, but it's it's a comparable model. Um, but but we are switching actually to both. Yeah, I, I mean, do, do you have a hunch? Is there going to be any model organism that's going to come close to phenocopying COVID? Uh, I mean, obviously, we want we don't want to use pri. I mean, it would be grisly to get into primates, but. I guess they might. But even it. primates, I, th I think you're going to need a comorbidity. Like, I think, like, I bet if you took an obese hamster or an obese ferret or you, <laughs> or you grew them really old, like, th then I think you'd probably get there. But I, I feel like we're basically modeling teenagers. And, and I mean, teenagers are not registering any kind of disease, as far as I'm aware. Yeah. So, I mean, would that maybe argue for hamsters since they live, you know, relatively shortly, you could, you could get some old hamsters and... Maybe. I mean, I, we could try. It's a, uh, yeah, uh, talk to me in six months and I'll tell you what the results are. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, let's see. Oh, okay. So here's, um, here we have a question about um, interleukin-6. Um, and, and I've heard this from multiple sources that this seems to be one of the most promising therapeutic interventions that we have in the arsenal, um, you know, particularly uh, tocilizumab against IL-6 receptor. Um, do, do, I, but I've heard that more to treat the symptoms, treat the ARDS. Um, D d can you expound a bit on um, anti- Sure, no, no, sure. Uh, I mean, so the way I view this, and, and I think others share this point of view, is that really there are, there are two issues here. I think early on, um, before you get into respiratory distress there, if you could deal with the virus itself, uh, it would be beneficial. So, um, I mean, there's also talk about using interferon therapeutically. And like, I think early on, that probably would have some value when your problem was actually virus replication and your inability to, to clear virus early on. Um, I also think that a lot of the FDA repurposing uh, efforts that DARPA are doing right now, which I'm involved in, what we're really looking for are like blockers of entry or early replication that you could give prophylactically, because that would be a huge help to the international society, just to people in general, to, to get everything up and going uh, prophylactically. I agree with you though that once you get into respiratory distress in COVID-19. I don't think the problem is virus anymore. It's, it's clearly all about inflammation, right? Uh, and we know that this in, uh, in the publication, this work, which is a lot of this is now a publication in Cell, uh, 
Um, but we noted in the discussion that we do see elevated IL-6, we see this weird marker of IL-1 transcription regulation, and we see high levels of IL-1 in COVID-19 patients. It's just not unique to COVID-19 patients. And that really mirrors this cytokine release syndrome, which is something that uh, immunologists have noted for a while uh, following CAR-T um, treatment. Uh, and one of the things that, that there's like these back-to-back -back nature medicine papers uh, where they demonstrated basically that blocking IL-6 alone was not sufficient to short circuit cytokine release syndrome, you also had to block IL-1. So it was kind of, you had to do both. Uh, and so I, I do know that a number of trials of, to block IL-6 are ongoing with COVID-19. It does seem like a sound approach to move forward with, um, but I would, I would like to see some of those trials also include IL-1 in case it really does mimic cytokine release syndrome uh, um, per se, but, but I, time will tell, I guess. There's also, I mean, there's plenty of other chemokines going around that it would be good to block. Like immune modulation is, is, not, uh, is not a trivial thing to, to, to play with, and especially in comorbidity people who on are on a respirator. Like it's, it's a really tough situation. Yes. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, and this is something I'm interested in as well. Uh, this question comes from Jordan. Um, so given that you have all this, this data, um, including from patient samples. Um, have you guys been able to um, identify host factors that could modulate the cytokine response? And then we, you could maybe, uh, if you had a large enough data set, start to find um, alleles that would, you know, put you at risk, at greater or lower risk of having a bad outcome from infection. That is in the to-do pile. Uh, it has come up in numerous conversations. Uh, the bandwidth of my lab is running pretty thin these days. Uh, part of the reason why, I mean, we've really been releasing this data in real time, which has been really actually an interesting experiment in and of itself. Uh, and so people do certainly pick up the data and suggest drugs that there are known to bind certain signatures that come out of annotations. There have been discussions of certain alleles uh, in, in GWAS studies that might predict better or worse in outcomes with this disease. Uh, it's all too preliminary to talk about. Um, I do, one of the things I really like that has come out of it uh, from a number of groups actually is that a lot of people have taken all of the transcriptomic data that we've put out there, and they've used artificial intelligence to look for, you know, you, you look at genes up and down across the entire transcriptome, and then you look for compounds from, I think it's called the L100 library. It's part of like, it's a broad initiative where they've added in all these different compounds and they look at genes that go up and down, right? And you basically look for uh, preferably FDA approved compounds that induce basically the opposite signature than what you're seeing from virus. And so we have tried some of those drugs here, and some of them have performed so well in cells and organoids that we are now putting them into hamsters next week. And, wow. so, and, and there are some really crazy compounds that really have no business being in an antiviral assay. But I mean, if they work, it'll be fantastic. So maybe okay. I can come on in a couple of weeks and tell you all about these amazing drugs. But Ooh, we will have you back. Yeah, okay. Uh, did, did you see, is there any overlap between the um, drugs from, let, let's say, Kayvon and uh, Nevin's data sets? There are. So I'm also part of, um, so Matt Freeman and uh, Doug, I, Doug Eidenberg from uh, the Weiss Institute. Uh, the two of them and myself are part of a DARPA project to screen for down-selected FDA drugs that go through high-throughput sequencing. And on that short list, uh, there's actually quite a bit of overlap there between some of the drugs identified from Nevin's group, who's also part of a separate DARPA contract. So we're all aware of it and we're all talking to each other. So Adolfo is part of Nevin's group. So Adolfo and I can talk on our way to the BSL-3 here. Uh, and so it, it is nice in that there's not, uh, there's not a redundancy happening. It's really nice to see that there's overlap in a lot of these assays. Um, it is important though to remember that like the way this generally works is the first screens are generally a BSL-2, like biosafety level two screen in Bureau cells with a lentivirus. So you're really screening for entry blockers. Uh, and that's great, but blocking entry is not the only thing we can do. And so those do go forward and we test those out in more sophisticated organoid systems against real viruses. And if those look good, we go into animals. 
but I'm also really looking forward to some of this. Um, like one of the things I like about the transcriptomic kind of AI approach is that rather than, and Nevin's approach for that matter, is rather than just looking at entry to look at other things like the replicases and the proteases, because there, you know, you could really hit the, the, the virus at multiple levels and use combination drugs, which would be great. Yeah, I, I, I mean, yeah, I, I think a lot of people predicting that if we beat this, it's gonna be with massive combination therapy. Probably. Um, let's see, uh, next question up is from Matteo. Um, I hope I don't catch you off guard, but this is not something you specifically referred to. There's a lot of talk about um, ADE, antibody dependent enhancement, um, and whether that's a factor for SARS-2. Um, the literature um, showed that it, it could happen for SARS-1 and MERS. Um, you, you obliquely mentioned it when you showed your microglial data and they seemed pretty resistant. And you said maybe macrophages would be similarly resistant. Do you, do you think you could um, uh, set up an assay where you could toss in non-neutralizing antibodies and see if, see if you can replicate ADE in culture? So I know, I know at least one lab uh, here at Sinai who is, is investigating that formally. Um, uh, that's, that's way out of my wheelhouse, so I'll, I, I'll choose not to answer that question. Hey, uh, okay, okay. We'll ask you when we have you back in a couple sure. of weeks to talk about the, the, the drug screen. Um, let's see. Okay, um, I, ho I hope you don't mind if we keep you for a couple more no, minutes. No, I'm happy to talk to you. Okay, fantastic. We, we, the questions go on and on. Um, uh, Darcy and a couple other question, uh, uh, people are asking questions about the species jump from bats or pangolins or whatever it was. Um, is there, you know, it, I, I, can you mine your data set to get an idea of, of um, you know, how the species leap occurred? And maybe can you put the proposed progenitor viruses through your screen? The, the one, the pangolin is like 90% identical and then the bat one I think is like 94% identical. Uh, it just seemed like, you know, it was such a perfect storm for this all to come together. Yeah, um, I mean, I can't answer that question very well. Um, I, I guess like from my perspective, what makes this virus um, the problem that it is, is its increased transmissibility, which is probably a byproduct of the pangolin spike, and coupled to its immunomodulatory activity. And in the immunomodulatory activity, I think it looks just like SARS-CoV-1, which isn't surprising because it's like ORF6 and the protease, these are all the, the SARS genes that are thought to manipulate IRF activation, STAT1 translocation, just general host shutoff. And so since those strategies are the same, I mean, SARS-CoV-1 was also a very nasty virus with high morbidity and high mortality. It just didn't have the transmissibility uh, that this one does. And so to me, what you're really referring to is like the the homologous recombination that occurred between, let's say, a, a pangolin coronavirus and bat coronavirus has, has given this new strain um, greater transmissibility, which has really caused the problem. But its, its phenotype at a cellular level and at a physiological level, I think, is the same as SARS-CoV-1, which just speaks right back to, like, I don't think you can mine the transcriptomic data to determine why this one became a much bigger pandemic versus the other one. It probably has to do with the affinity and avidity for spike and ACE2 would be my guess. And the, and the fear insights, what also gets cut easier, right? Yes, yes. Um, okay, I, I'll, I'll just um, give, you, give you maybe one or two more here and then let you, we'll let you go about your day. Um, Siva asks a question about uh, co-infections. And I have, I have seen a lot of reports that um, people doing metagenomics on COVID patients are reporting 
at abnormally high numbers of, of co-infections. Uh, first, I guess I would ask you, do you think that, that that's real? Um, and co-infections with what? With other viruses, other bacteria? Or oh, other... Uh, yeah, what, what I've seen is, um, yeah, other viruses, bacteria, f uh, fungi, uh, y y you, you name it, that, that more things are, are showing up in COVID-19 patients than would be expected. Uh, I have to say, I have received a few messages of people who have mined our data and noted they find, you know, a fragment here and a fragment there of some bacteria or some virus. Um, part of that, I think, is just the world is dirty. And I think if you sequenced a healthy lung, you'd probably find a lot of that stuff, too. I think part of yeah. the problem is when you get 250 million reads and you start looking at <laughs> individual reads, you can pretty much find anything you want. Yeah. Um, I can say our data supports that there's another agent that's really adding to this. I, I, I don't think that's a necessary part of the hypothesis. I mean, it, it might be, but there's no evidence to suggest that it is. Yeah, okay. Um, let's see, I'm just looking, I'm just gonna give you one more question here. Uh, I, can't, I can't find the exact wording, but um, the, the question was about the involvement of uh, and potential interaction with stress granules. Um, are you seeing anything in your data about that? Uh, again, I don't want to end on this question because I, I can't really speak to that. Uh, we, we, I mean, we do see uh, quite a, a neutrophil, uh, like as far as things that we can note in SARS-CoV-2 infections in general is there is uh, definitely uh, infiltration of neutrophils and macrophages. We definitely see that. We definitely see a cascade, a complement cascade, uh, which is quite interesting, especially given like the coagulation mm -hmm. uh, phenotype that's been observed. Um, but stress granules per se, yeah, see this is, this is why I like putting things up on GEO is because everybody comes at it with their own interests and their own angles and their own uh, focus. It has not come up, like if you, if you grab a list of differentially expressed genes and you throw them on StringDB or uh, Avimeons and richer programs, for example, I, you don't see stuff like that pop up on the first, I don't know, 20 hits of, of significant pathways that are enriched, for example, but that doesn't mean it's not there. Uh, I would suggest whoever asked that question to, to peruse the data and see what they see and get back to me. Yeah. Okay, well, since you didn't want to end on that question, uh, we'll end on one more question, which is from Darcy. Um, are you going to re-challenge those ferrets and um, hmm. see, see what happens the second time around? Uh, I guess we could. We're not, only because um, uh, ferrets take up BSL-3 space, which is uh, not unlimited, and we need to turn them over so that we can test as many drugs as possible. So it is a conflict between basic science and actually finding a therapeutic that, that might be useful to the world. Uh, and so we're going to put off basic science on that one for a little while. Um, but I do have to say, there's a study that just came out of Sinai on BioArchive. It's like Viviana Simone and uh, Florian Kramer, amongst others. But it's a really good one. They had something like uh, don't quote me on the numbers, but it's something like they had 1,500 um, serum from patients, half of which had tested PCR positive for SARS and half of which uh, uh, were, were thought to have been positive, but they never actually got a test. And they checked them for antibodies. And um, the group that tested positive also built up antibodies and they have now mapped them longitudinally. And what is clear is that their antibody titers increase over time. And they also did PCR looking for the virus. And what they can find is even as the titers of the antibodies rise, they can still pick up pieces of virus. Mm -hmm. And they mentioned this in, the, in their manuscript, but I think if you want to extrapolate a little bit into this question, I think this idea that people are getting infected twice is, is probably not true. That what's actually happening is they have antibodies. It doesn't, there's no evidence to suggest that you can get reinfected when you have high antibody titers. Uh, and that any PCR positive test you get there after, it's probably just a fragment of the virus sticking around. Again, sometimes our tests are a little too sensitive, right? And, and PCR positive does not mean infectious units and, and infectious. So uh, I thought the study did a really good job at delineating those two worlds and suggesting that there's really no evidence to suggest that this virus, once you recover from it, that you'll ever get it again.
Well, I wouldn't go that far. I, I mean, it's well, there's no evidence for it. Well, right, but I, I, they, there's a question uh, there, you know, uh, from other coronaviruses, you know, it's not clear how long the IgGs are gonna stay. Yeah, okay, that's a different point. So yes, I mean, in years after this, your immunity may wane. I mean, if you get this infection, uh, and three weeks later you recover, the antibody titers you have are going to be high enough to ensure that you don't get it circa 2020 or 2021. Yeah, let's all hope. I, I think Sarah- And do you have one time for one last question, please? Yeah. Uh, this is following up on the interleukin-6. Um, I know there are some clinical trials involving interleukin-6 inhibitors. So uh, is, does it make sense to follow up on those patients to see uh, if there's susceptibility for COVID? 19 infection or something along those lines. Yes, and I think actually those studies are being done in, in many hospitals worldwide. They're certainly happening here in New York. So it is a really good point and people are on that for sure. And also speaking of combination therapy, because in your study you see both interleukin-6 and interleukin-1 being elevated. Do you think a combination of these two interleukins or a cocktail might, I know we touched upon this briefly, but. Yes, no, no, I, I really think they should. I mean, the problem is though that even if that works, that would be such an expensive therapy that it's not really a solution for worldwide um, health anyways. So we still need to find an FDA drug that can just short circuit this. That would be the best, uh, you know, barring a vaccine, which would be ultimately uh, what we need. Yeah, well, Ben, that was amazing. Um, it was my pleasure, Lauren, thanks for having me. Thanks for the work you're doing. Thanks for the talk you gave. And um, yeah, let, let's stay in touch. I, I, I really will take you up on okay. the offer of coming back. Happy to do so. Thanks. Thank yeah. you, Ben. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Take care, all. All right. Bye.